want to give you an example of what happened at the beginning of the Holocaust in the response to Kristallnacht, which set the tone for the way in which Jews responded publicly from 1938 to the end of the Holocaust, 1945. And it is very relevant to the discussion today. On the night of November 9th and continuing into November 10th, Nazi cadres conducted an orgy of violence against the Jews of Germany so brutal that the Atlanta Journal commented that to compare present day Germany and the Middle Ages is slandering the Middle Ages. 191 synagogues were burned down. Over 7,000 Jewish businesses and shops were destroyed and looted. 30,000 Jews were interned in Buchenwald, Dachau, and Sachsenhausen, and almost 100 Jews were killed, murdered, uh, if you will. It was so grotesque that the following day, November 11th, Armistice Day, the lead editorial in none other than the New York Times addressed itself to Kristallnacht. I'm not going to read uh, the editorial, but it was very strong, and it indicated this was not just mobs behaving. This was state-organized, which, of course, was the worst part uh, of the whole thing. Now, so you'll ask the question, what was the American Jewish response publicly to this terrible event, which there was a section in the New York Times for 15 days on German Jewry, you know, subjects in the index of the Times, German Jewish situation. That's how bad it was. So three days later, on November 13th, an organization called the General Jewish Council met. That organization was actually perhaps a forerunner of the President's Conference of today. It brought together the four leading public Jewish organizations, the American Jewish Congress, the American Jewish Committee, B'nai B'rith, and the Jewish Labor Committee. That was public Jewry in those days. And they met for six hours. Admittedly, only two of the hours were spent on German Jewry. But that's another subject uh, for, for another introduction. At the end of the two hours, after considerable debate, a resolution was put forward, resolved that it is the present sense of the General Jewish Council that there should be no parades public demonstrations or protests by Jews. No public action. Now, in the Friday Tug Morgan Journal, and the, the Tug rather then, and the Morgan Journal, and the Freiheit, and all the Jewish newspapers, there were cries for Jews to the streets. Do something. We can't let this go quietly. On Monday, November 14th, there were no calls for any kind of public action, which was actually what led me to look at the General Jewish Council and what it did. And of course, this is what it did. I read it again. Resolve that it is the present sense of the General Jewish Council that there should be no parades, public demonstrations, or protests by Jews. Ladies and gentlemen, that's my introduction to this very important program. Thank you, Rabbi. You'll walk out smarter, know some stuff, uh, and you'll be shocked by some of it. Uh, Rafi Medoff is one of the leading Holocaust historians in the world. Uh, if he's on to something, he's on to something original. Uh, you know he's doing the right thing 
because F FDR biographers hate him. They've done nothing but try to destroy his career. You should need to know, it's very important, this is not just a historian, he's a courageous historian, because you're simply not in the academy, and I think it's true of liberal American Jews. You're simply not allowed to criticize your kind. And your kind, if you're a liberal Jew, <laughs> is you can't criticize FDR. And so when people wonder this ongoing connection, you know, what is it with Jews in the Democratic Party? I think we can conclude it's Jews in FDR. It started with Jews in FDR, and it just gotten, not, I wouldn't say worse, but it's gotten more entrenched. And so this book, I think, comes up at the perfect time because it really gives you a sense of, wait a minute, FDR could not have been less helpful during the Holocaust. He was getting 80% of the votes. It was even a higher percentage, 80% of Jewish votes. Jews adored him. They had his photos up in, in the living room. And he was also the one that did less than everyone and thwarted every effort, every opportunity. As Rafi points out in this book, uh, there, there were small gestures, things you could have done without an enormous amount of political capital. Gornished, nothing. He, he, he was a classic gladhander. I was thrown by the book. Uh, we'll get to this, some of this. I just want to tell you things that I was thrown by. I guess never thought of um, Roosevelt as being so charismatic that he could, he could rope you into his orbit, put his arm around you, say anything, you'd walk out and feel like he gave you everything and he actually promised you nothing. And that you would go back and report to the Jewish community, oh, I had a, I, what a meeting I had with President, I, I called him Franklin, he called me Stephen, I need, you, 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 the wise would walk out of these White House sessions telling Jewish leadership what an experience that was. And then they say, and what did you get? Well, he said, and then they weren't sure, and then he, he, would, he would exaggerate, right? Rafi says that Wise would end up exaggerating that something was coming out of it. But in, for the life of Adonai, there is no way that he, Roosevelt ever said that. Uh, and yet he walked out thinking that the best interest of Jew, world Jewry was on the president's mind. So um, you can't criticize Roosevelt and so many of Rafi's public lectures, his books, um, all of his books are really great, but this is, the, this is his topic that he was born to do. Uh, he's been involved in this for decades. This book with this title, with Roosevelt, I mean, to me, this is, this is a play. This should be a, an off-Broadway play. This story with Roosevelt and Wise is enormously fascinating. It's enormously psychological. It's unbelievably dramatic because Roosevelt was hearing everything was happening throughout the early pre-Holocaust era, immediately when Hitler came to power, you see, we forget the small things that happen. Still riotous, violent actions, murders taken against Jews. We were still six, six or seven years away from the Holocaust, and yet new, news reports of what was happening, and Roosevelt and, and many American Jews, especially, <laughs> you shall know, the ones that didn't attend Temple Emanuel <laughs> and did not uh, attend the Harmony Club. If you apparently, if you attended Temple Emanuel in the 30s and you were a member of the Harmony Club, you would have, you thought that anything coming out of Germany was false. It was a bunch of immigrant Jews making stuff up. You couldn't trust them, you know, the dirty Jews, the unwashed Jews. The German Jews of the 19th century, who were the Machers, and by the 1930s, they had clubs and a major synagogue. Uh, they just didn't trust the reports. And they didn't trust, and they certainly didn't want any uh, the United States people to hear that there was these exaggerated reports because they feared a backlash against American Jewry, and especially them, because they all lived on Fifth Avenue. You know, they had made it, and they simply refused to tell a story that might frighten what already the United States that was going through a depression and had xenophobic attitudes, and they thought we can't do anything to give American, America's citizens the fear that they're going to be the unwashed citizens, the other Jews, the ones on the Lower East Side. We already have too many of them. 
this is the dark side of American Jewry, and you get this in this book. So, uh, first, let us welcome my friend and well-known author and courageous Holocaust historian, Raphael Medoff. Thank you. So, R Rafi, briefly tell us, you know, your other day job is the Wyman Institute. You're the founder of the Wyman Institute. Uh, if you tell them briefly, they'll understand why everything you've evolved around, even this book, uh, emanates from that organization. I'll describe the Wyman Institute, but uh, if I may, first I want to begin with a joke. Because Thane mentioned the extraordinarily high levels of electoral support that American Jews gave to Franklin Roosevelt, 85%, 90%, reminded me of something. Um, on the eve of the very first lecture I ever gave in public, I nervously asked a friend of mine whose father was a prominent reform rabbi and, and well known for um, his sermons, if there's any particular advice he could give me that he remembered from his father's experiences. And he said, always start out with a joke. He said his father would, would tell a joke that had nothing to do with the content of the sermon. It was simply to get everybody into sort of a lighter mood as he, as he then delved into a more serious subject. Well, and, that, and I was sort of confounded by that advice because as a historian of the Holocaust, I mean, what kind of jokes is one going to tell? But if you work in the archives and you research and you write enough, enough years, you will eventually come come across somewhere in somebody's correspondence or a diary or something, a joke. Um, and I have come across two, believe it or not, and it happens that they perfectly sum up some of the themes that we're going to be discussing tonight and which I expand upon in the book. The first one comes from a Jewish Republican in the 1930s who was so f was frustrated by the, the high uh, Jewish vote that FDR kept receiving. And his, and his joke went like this. <clears throat> he said, it seems like the Jews have three worlds, or Velten. This joke is a play on the Yiddish word for world, Velt. It seems like the Jews have three Velten. Die Welt, this world. Yenevelt, the world to come. And Roosevelt. The second joke involves Rabbi Stephen S. Wise, the foremost leader of the American Jewish community in the 1930s and 1940s. Wise um, had a meeting around 1936, I believe, with Dr. Sigmund Freud. And Freud asked him, who would you say were the five most influential Jews in history? Wise thought for a moment, and then he said, well, Moses, Jesus, Marx, uh, Brandeis, and of course you, Dr. Freud. And Freud said to him, why didn't you include yourself in that list? To which Rabbi Wise answered, no, 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 no. Freud responded, if you had said no one time, I would have believed you. But <laughs> Seven times? The funny thing is the source of this, of this second joke is Rabbi Wise himself. Although you think it doesn't reflect well on him or his ego. In fact, he was so delighted to even be mentioned in a conversation about the most influential Jews in, in human history that he told this to reporters. He leaked it. He didn't want himself named as the source, but he told it to reporters and that's how it, it gained currency. Now, to be a Jewish leader, you do need a certain amount of ego. Um, there's no doubt about that. You're in the public spotlight. Um, and in Rabbi Wise's case, <clears throat> he was in the public spotlight more than any other Jewish leader in his time. He was the head of the American Jewish Congress, the World Jewish Congress. He headed a rabbinical seminary known as the Jewish Institute of Religion, which later became part of Hebrew Union College. He was head of the American Zionist movement. He ran a synagogue. I mean, can you imagine the leader of any one Jewish organization today, in fact, running five major Jewish institutions simultaneously? It's extraordinary. But to have that kind of commitment, 
also involves a certain amount of overcommitment, meaning he was stretched very thin. And to have that kind of ego, to insist on being at the helm of all these different organizations, that kind of ego also made him vulnerable. And it shaped his relationship with President Franklin Roosevelt because Roosevelt perceived and understood when the person he was dealing with just needed a little, what did you call it, glad handing, a little stroking to get what he wants and to throw the other person off their game and off their agenda. And as the book shows, President Roosevelt exploited that advantage to the maximum. So let's, since this has such relevance for today's political culture, is it fair to say that there's something um, unique about Jews' connection, the electoral support that they gave to FDR? Um, who did, who did, who, who did Jews overwhelmingly support in prior elections? Uh, is it start with FDR? And what was it about FDR? Is it because of the Depression and the New Deal and the social justice? <clears throat> Remember, you know, Mayor F F F LaGuardia was partly Jewish, and he spoke a fluent Yiddish. Uh, of course New York Jews loved him, as well as Italian Jews. Loved him. But there wasn't obviously anything about Roosevelt. In fact, one of the things that I want to talk about today, this morning is some of the, what I think, original material that you pulled out that's new, which spoke to Roosevelt. When you said joke, that's what I thought you were going to say, that Roosevelt, we're now seeing, was an anti-Semite. He had anti-Semitic attitudes. He told anti-Semitic jokes. He liked jokes, anti-Semitic jokes. He and his mother, you know, had very harsh feelings about, you know, Jewish immigrants. It's one of the reasons why he treated Asian Americans to an internment in California. He saw the Asians and the Jews as the same problem, and they always feared that two things, that there would be too many of them, and that they wouldn't know how to assimilate. This is the two things that he was scared about. R remember, you know, Roosevelt does not uh, intern Italian Americans, and, Itali and Italy was in World War II. Why not take all the Italian Americans and put them in a camp? What was it about the Asians that needed to be in a camp? Is it because of uh, Pearl Harbor was so extraordinary that there was fear, the fierce fear of spies? By the way, until I read this book, I never really thought that people walked around and spent that much time worrying about Jewish spies. There's several times in this book where someone gives an excuse. Well, you know, you bring in too many Jews, you know they're natural spies. You know, even if they don't want it, they may, be, they may become involuntary spies. They may be deluded to become spies. So you have to be very careful. Don't bring them in at this time during this war effort. Even though there was not one piece of evidence, there was, there was no Jonathan Pollard to begin with. There was nothing like that. But that was what was thought. So just help us in the political culture. Does the democratic affection and almost uh, slavish devotion so that they would never... Even today, you're not the only room full of Jews who knows something about this. But I don't, I've never been to a Shabbat dinner party where Roosevelt's name comes up and says, Jew hater, or I can't believe what he didn't do, he could have done. Never. It never comes up. It's as if you simply can't say it. So help us understand this natural attraction. The, the question of FDR's private um, opinions about Jews is an extremely sensitive one. To begin with, it's something which um, FDR's biographer, biographers almost don't touch. The early biographies don't touch it at all, and even in the, in the more recent ones, it's barely addressed. The first time I, as a young historian, encountered um, evidence of of Roosevelt privately being hostile to Jews is in the pages of The Abandonment of the Jews, Professor David S. Wyman's landmark book, published in 1984. Well, The Abandonment of the Jews, to this day, is the gold standard in the field of America's response to the Holocaust. It was a bestseller uh, in 1984, which especially then was very unusual for a book about the Holocaust. Uh, pro after Professor Wyman retired, um, 15 or so years after the book was published, uh, to, I, together with a number of um, colleagues who are from the, the next generation of scholars of American response to the Holocaust, 
approached him with the idea of, of creating a, an organization that would carry on his research. Um, he was the first to say that his book was not the final word, that there was much more to be researched and published and spoken about in terms of how not just the American government, but the American media, American Jewry. Well, can you just explain that one thing, that the book is a complete takedown of America and the Holocaust, right? So that it is a, a kind of laundry list of everyone who failed, professional baseball players, you know, the kinds of people that could have said something who had influence who didn't. I think that's important, which is why you're saying it invited more books, right? It was probably the first book that talked about the failure of the New York Times. Then years later, Laura Leff, our friend, wrote a book about Holocaust in the New York Times. So one of the things that was valuable about this book is that it just it was a laundry list of every failure that America uh, perpetrated in not responding to the Holocaust. Yes, the abandonment of the Jews was really the first comprehensive scholarly study of how the Roosevelt administration responded to the Holocaust, as well as um, other segments of American society, but it primarily focused on FDR and his administration. Um, it was a shock to most people, to people who had grown up, to you know, entire generations of Americans who had grown up with an image of FDR as this like, sort of iconic figure who uh, led America out of the Great Depression, as he did, and led America to the brink of victory in World War II, as he did, before tragically passing away in office. So the idea of discovering um, all of these sort of skeletons in the closet of the president and his administration was very jarring to the American public. But by 1984, people were ready to, to hear it, um, and that's why the book was such a success. Uh, but precisely because it was, it's important to carry on that work and continue to study and understand and expose um, the ways in which Americans responded. And I'm talking also about American churches, the American news media, as Thane mentioned, a very powerful book called Buried by the Times, analyzed how the New York Times covered or failed to cover the Holocaust. Uh, and other work needs to be done. And for that reason, we created the David S. Wyman Institute for Holocaust Studies. The broader question here, the Jewish appeal to Roosevelt, despite the fact that we, that, that we now know, Roosevelt uh, privately had very unfriendly um, attitudes and opinions regarding Jews. But I was going to say, the, the, the way I first encountered that, that fact, which was surprising to me, you know, as a young historian, was in the pages of the abandonment of the Jews, where Professor Wyman mentioned something which I had not seen in any biography of President Roosevelt or, or any of the other works about, um, about the Holocaust and, and, and how the world responded. And that was a, a meeting that Roosevelt ha held in Casablanca in early 1943 with the local, um, the local French officials who were going to be in charge of that region on the heels of the Allied liberation of North Africa. They were discussing what to do about the Jews. There were over 300,000 Jews living in Algeria, Libya, Tunisia, Morocco. What would be their status? Because under the previous French Vichy, the pro-Nazi regime, the Jews had of course been stripped of all their rights and many had been put in forced labor camps and so on. So the question was, would they now have their rights restored now that the Allies, um, the Allies ruled North Africa? And when the, when the French officials brought this up, Roosevelt said, to their surprise, um, no, they should not, be, um, they should not have those, those rights restored willy-nilly, but rather there should be strict limits on allowing, allowing the local Jews into various professions, into various occupations. There should be quotas. Why? Because he said, and now I'm speaking about a transcript. We have an actual transcript because this was an official government meeting and there was a, one of Roosevelt's um, top aides was there as the official transcriber. And the president said, because um, otherwise you'll have a situation like we had in Germany where the German populace, as how he put it, he said the Germans, understandably were very upset and, in, and enraged because the Jews in Germany um, occupied more than half of all the positions in the schools and in medicine and in law and so forth. Of course, the statistics were wildly off, but the very idea 
that the president looked at the, the German reaction, and there's the rise of Nazism, the persecution of the Jews, as, as in his words, an understandable reaction to Jewish overrepresentation, Jewish domination, allegedly, of certain German professions and many aspects of German public life. That was the, the, the shocking thing to me, that the president could have said this. And then the second question is, well, how come no one ever wrote about this before? How come I'm only reading about this for the first time in 1984, after dozens of biographies of Roosevelt had already been published? And the answer is that, um, the answer is not that it wasn't known, because as I, as I say, it was an official transcript. It appeared in a, a series of government publications called Foreign Relations of the United States, which every historian of American foreign policy is, is, is deeply familiar with. Yet biographers had chosen not to mention it. It was, clearly was very embarrassing. Now, it goes without saying, may, maybe it should be said, the biographies of FDR are overwhelmingly sympathetic. In general, they are very, very reluctant to look at his flaws in any regard. So perhaps this was part of the, of, of the, of the broader problem, that things which reflected very negatively on the president simply didn't make their way into, um, into the books. And, and to give you one more example of this, which I encountered some years ago, um, many of you know the name Arthur Schlesinger. He's, he wrote an important three-volume series about FDR's presidency in the late 1950s, and he's also a confidant to several presidents. Um, I came across Schlesinger's name quite by accident in the following, in the following instance. Um, out in, in Montana, there's a collection of, um, of papers of a U.S. senator who had had um, some dealings with Roosevelt in the 30s, and, and, and there was a record in there in 1939 of the senator, Burton Wheeler, of the senator's conversation with the president. Um, in, the, in the summer of 1939, they were talking about who might be the candidate in 1940, who might be the presidential candidate. At this point, FDR had not announced that he was going to run again. Um, and he, um, and maybe he was, maybe he in fact was uncertain whether he'd run again. So he and Senator Wheeler, fellow Democrat, uh, were having a sort of a, you know, a friendly discussion about possible nominees. Wheeler mentioned Cordell Hull, the Secretary of State, to which Roosevelt objected on the grounds that Secretary Hull's wife was partially Jewish, that is her father, and that this would be a liability in a presidential campaign. At which point, the president then launch into a little riff about how, you know, Bert, you and I know what kind of blood we have in our veins. We've got old Dutch blood. We don't have any of that Jewish blood. But people like Hull and his wife, it's another story. So, and the, the tone of the exchange of the president's remarks is extremely disparaging, this Jewish blood stuff. In the file in the Montana archives, next to Senator Wheeler's recollection of the conversation, there's a little exchange with Arthur Schlesinger. This goes back to about 1959. Schlesinger was working on one of the volumes in his books, which were among the, among the most famous early uh, studies of Roosevelt and, the, and his presidency. And Schlesinger had written to Senator Wheeler, who was then still alive, to ask him about various things. And this memo had come up, and Wheeler shared with Schlesinger the memo. Now, Wheeler was a, a fan of Roosevelt. The memo was a pro just his private, private note for the records. He had never intended to publish it. He, didn't, he had no intention of embarrassing the president. But now it's you know, 15, 20 years later. So he shared it with Schlesinger. I could see that from the correspondence. And yet when I went and looked at Schlesinger's books, there was no mention of it. By the way, in, the, in this memo where they're discussing, where he's making the comments about Jewish blood, he also makes very disparaging comments about African Americans. And they use the N word which I suppose was common in those days, of course, but that makes it no less disturbing, coming from the mouth of a president or a United States senator. In any event, none of this is in Schlesinger's book, um, his, his, his books. So I wrote to Schlesinger at the time, and I, I said, I'm just curious, I, I see you were aware of this memo, you saw that Roosevelt made these disparaging comments about Jewish blood, why didn't you see fit to mention it? And he wrote me back this very evasive, note, he said, it didn't strike me that it was pejorative. It seemed like it was a neutral comment about people of mixed ancestry. 
But in your book, blood comes up a number of times. It's surprising. Uh, also, you have Roosevelt talk about uh, Aryan purity. He uses the word Aryan in a number of places in the book. And here we are, I'm reading this, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, uh, blood uh, and Aryan, Aryan purity. What other figure in the, 20, in the 30s was using that language? It was, it was Hitler. It was an odd coincidence. Now, again, this drives, would drive any FDR uh, historian crazy, but he was saying these things. These were his beliefs. He believed in a superiority of bloodline and linkage. He didn't trust. He was very suspicious of, of uh, what he called Asi Asiatic groups and, and, and Jews uh, and, 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 and harbored anti-Semitic beliefs. Uh, and he was essentially fix fixated on blood. Well, to be fair, um, these kinds of attitudes regarding blood, regarding foreigners, um, and of course immigration, were very common in the 1920s and 1930s. Except that, see, that's the problem, right? Because when you say that, when you say that, you feed right into what Roosevelt historians say, or for, for that matter, Roosevelt fans would say. You weren't there in the 1930s. You did not know that the general public was very nativistic, and they did not want uh, foreigners here. They were xenophobic and nativistic, and they didn't want their jobs to be taken by unwashed Jews. Uh, you didn't know that Congress in the 30s was absolutely anti-immigration. Uh, they, they couldn't talk to a congressman about expanding immigration in the 1930s. And you had a White House that had creepy feelings about Jews. And those creepy feelings, according to what you said, were shared among the general population. So that it's easy today to say, oh my God, we would have just boycotted and we would have protested and we would have gotten the country behind us and we would have lobbied Congress and we would have told the president in no uncertain terms that you have creepy attitudes about blood and Aryans and unless you want to be called Hitler, stop talking like that. We are Jews, we have rights and our brothers are being slaughtered. The people would say you'd be crazy to make that kind of a speech because this is what people believed in the 1930s. On the one hand, a lot of people believed this in the 1930s. But on the other hand, and this is what the book explains, is that the fact that public opinion was anti-foreigner, anti-immigrant, to some extent anti-Semitic, the fact that Congress was to a certain extent um, hostile to Jews and certainly hostile to immigration, these were not the reasons why President Roosevelt refused to open the doors wider to Jewish refugees, why he refused to take any meaningful steps to help Jews during the Holocaust, why the administration turned down the appeals to bomb Auschwitz or the railways leading to it. That's the key point. Even though much of the public was in favor of keeping out the Jews, there were still so many ways that more Jews could have been admitted despite public sentiment. What do I mean? What I mean is, America in those days had immigration quotas. It wasn't a time of no immigration. It wasn't as if the doors were closed and nobody could get in and so Roosevelt's hands were tied. The doors were partially open. They just weren't open nearly as wide as they had been before the quotas were imposed. But the quotas allowed a certain number of people from every country to come to the US each year based on their national origin. So for example, Germany, about 28,000 people, German citizens, could, in principle, immigrate to the U.S. each year within the existing law. But what I show in the book is that, in fact, in 11 of Roosevelt's 12 years in office, that quota was not filled. And in most of those years, it was less than 25% filled. What does that mean? Practical terms and mathematical terms, it means if you add up all of those unused quota places from Germany and then later from German-occupied countries, like Hung Hungary and Czechoslovakia, right? nearly 200,000 Jews could have come to the United States under the existing quota without Roosevelt having to do anything. He didn't have to fight against public opinion. He didn't have to have a big clash with Congress. He didn't have to risk his, um, his political future because it was already part of the law. 
the law as it existed would have allowed it. The problem is the, that the administration went above and beyond the law to find all kinds of bureaucratic and administrative ways to make it almost impossible for most Jewish refugees to qualify to come to the U.S. So the problem was not public opinion, the problem was not Congress, the problem was not even the existing law, although we wish the existing quotas had been more generous. But the first part of the first, first and foremost, the problem here is that nearly 200,000 quota places sat unused during the period under discussion. But, but part of that can be accounted for a paternalistic attitude as the president of the country who believed that through Jewish racial characteristics, ethnic characteristics, uh, they engage in certain types of Jewish behavior that makes them hated. Because he actually said that in a number of instances, you gave the example in Morocco. But it happened very several different times. Is what, you, what you're hearing a president say is, look, I'm the president of the United States and I just don't think the country is better off with more Jews. Because of who they are, the characteristics they are, uh, it's only going to cause more tension within our country. And this is the question ultimately which drives um, this new book. The question is why? Why? If the law already allowed them to come in, why go out of his way to keep them out? If American planes were already bombing targets within five miles of Auschwitz, why not let them drop a couple of bombs on the railways or the crematoria? In other words, why, why go that extra distance? If Secretary of State Morgenthau proposed allowing the passengers on the St. Louis, the voyage of the dam, those 930 German Jewish refugees, Morgenthau proposed allowing them to go temporarily to the U.S. Virgin Islands. Where they were welcomed by the governor. The gov yes, the governor and the legislative assembly of the Virgin Islands um, in the aftermath of the Kristallnacht pogrom publicly offered to take in Jewish refugees. Now, can, can, just, can we deviate for a second? Because I know something that you know that they don't know, uh, which is that it's not, it's not totally surprising that the Virgin Islands would have taken this position, right? Didn't we do a conference on this, that they've had a historic connection to Jews? That is the reason, isn't it? Isn't it that it wasn't, it was, yes, humanitarian, but also we have Jews here, and we, we are, it may not appear to any, but we are actually a perfect safe haven for Jews. Um, and of course, there's a practical interest. For example, you know, a, a, it was a U.S. territory, not a state, um, if it needed more, more laborers, it needed more capital. Um, German Jews were ready to come and because to, to get away from Nazism, they would, would gladly come and start a new life in a place like the Virgin Islands. And Morgenthau proposed it, but the President and the Secretary of State came up with a technicality as to why the passengers on the ship could not be allowed to stay in, um, in the Virgin Islands temporarily on tourist visas is what Morgan will propose. And just by the way, the technicality went like this. A tourist visa is good for six months. In order to qualify for a tourist visa, you have to show that you have a permanent address in your home country to which you will return. So word came from the White House through Hull to Morgenthau, we can't let these Jews go into the Virgin Islands on tourist visas because they don't have a safe return address to which they can go. So therefore, we're gonna send them back to that very place. See the catch-22? So, so again, back to my question, why? So why go out of your way when they could have just easily said, you know what, it's an emergency, they can't go back, yeah, they can stay there, the governor wants them anyway. Now, this is a question which was not addressed um, in the first wave of scholarship on America's response to the Holocaust. Important research um, was published, including, obviously, Professor Wyman's book, but this ultimate question of why the president went out of his way, why not just allow the quotas to be used, why not allow the planes to drop bombs since they're there anyway, why not allow the Virgin Islands to serve as a haven since everybody else wants them to go there? The question of why is something that has haunted me. When I first, when I first began to look into the, this phenomenon of what, of what the what FDR might have been saying privately about Jews. It was kind of a, a search for a needle in a haystack. But little by little, over the course of the last decade, additional remarks emerged. Things that Roosevelt said, um, 
some of them are, are brought forth in this book for the first time. And I notice a common theme. Now, earlier I mentioned what Roosevelt said in Casablanca in 1943 about the Jews allegedly being overrepresented in German professions. And, and causing resentment. And causing resentment as a result. This, this was the common theme that I found. That every time, every time the president was talking about Jews, whether they were in Germany or Poland in the United, or in the United States, he was always concerned with this idea that if you have too many Jews in any one place, they are going to become dominant and they're going to try to reshape the culture or control the economy or, or determine um, the direction of the country. At one point we have um, in the diaries of Secretary Morgenthau a conversation in 1941, a conversation in the cabinet in 1941. Roosevelt had just returned from a trip to Oregon um, and he complained to the cabinet there seemed to be so many Jews among the pu public employees in Oregon. Which led them into a discussion then in which the president then boasted about how when he had been on the, the board of Harvard in the 1920s, he helped impose a quota on Jewish students. Because he said, of course, you can't have too many of them coming to the university. So it's the same theme. Too many Jews here, too many Jews there. Which also explains the not actually fulfilling the quotas. As if to say, I'm prepared to, we have a law that permits numbers of Jews, but I'm going to have it low and it's going to be divided among different countries. And I hope they'll assimilate, but this will make sure that they don't become dominant. Exactly. If, you, if your goal is to keep America overwhelmingly white, Anglo-Saxon, and Protestant, then a bunch of European Jews are about the least desirable newcomers. But the way it all took shape for me as a historian, and you'll see it in the book, was when a few years ago um, I began reading a recently published book about Roosevelt's decision to intern 120,000 Japanese Americans. And that historian too, Professor Greg Robinson of Montreal, he was also looking for why. He had read all the books about the internment um, and was disturbed as anyone that a great you know, liberal, a man known as a humanitarian, Franklin Roosevelt, could do something unjust to people on the basis of, of just you know, racist suspicion, not because any Japanese Americans had been caught uh, spying for Japan. He was also looking for the answer, why? And he found it in a series of articles that the president had written in the 1920s. Now, just a note here, this is right before FDR became governor of New York, but after he had already been an unsuccessful vice presidential candidate in 1920. So he's a mature, public, political figure. And he was a newspaper columnist for a couple of years in Georgia, where he was recuperating from um, polio. In those columns, he discusses the question of what he calls the Orientals, Asians, specifically Japanese. And he describes there in, in terms that we today could only consider horrifically racist, he describes the reasons why we can't allow um, Japanese to immigrate to America and the ones who are here, we can't allow them to have full rights because they can't be, they can't be fully assimilated. They can't be trusted. If there are too many of them, they will try to control and dominate. And I started to notice a, a, an echo, a parallel to the kinds of things that I had been finding he had been saying about Jews. They, you can't, they won't fully become Americans. They can't be fully trusted. This is the common theme in Franklin Roosevelt's private comments about Jews and in his not at all private public comments about, about Asians, about Asians and Asian Americans. And that's when I realized that the, the core of his thinking when it came to the Jewish refugee crisis of the 1930s and the Holocaust, the core of it was he really did not want too many Jews coming into America. That was the bottom line. I want to get back to um, the title of the book. It's a provocative one, The Jews Should Keep Quiet. It actually is a quote from someone actually says it in the book, The Jews Should Keep Quiet. The president says it. Right, someone says it. Um, you know, many, many people think about Jews, certainly from the 1930s and 1940s, they're saying, well, the Jews of the year 2018, 2019, well-established, entrenched in every capacity that one could be, the Jews of the 1930s and 1940s were still largely immigrants. 
Yes, there were occasional partners in major law firms and bankers on Fifth Avenue, the, what we could call the Temple Emanuel crowd. But most of them were still Lower East Side, very Brooklyn, uh, very much looking like the, the, you know, the immigrants of the United States. But one of the things that I found surprising in the book is that for all of the talk about the immigrant would be withdrawn, too grateful to be here, we're, the Jews were living in a, in a depression and they were surviving in a depression and they were surviving in a depression that they weren't being blamed for and there were no pogroms on the Lower East Side, they must have thought this is the most incredible country in the world. The country is in a depression and they're not beating up my son-in-law, thinking it's him, kicking him in the face. So you can see why they would say, well, look, Shah still, we can't in front of the Gentiles show that we are being politically engaged on behalf of Jews elsewhere in other countries. But in your book, it, it's, it's mind bending. It's the opposite. It, you get Wise is, heads the American Jewish Congress. The American Jewish Congress is filled with those people I'm just talking about, lower middle class Jews, from the street, total grassroots. The other organizations, the American Jewish Committee, B'nai B'rith, they've got the college-educated wealthy bankers. They're the ones that are afraid of igniting incitement uh, among American population against Jews. The, the immigrants are saying, boycott, march, let's do something at Madison Square Garden. We can get 25,000 people into Madison Square Garden. And, so, and that's the group that Wise has led, ironically, right? So he has to tamp them down. And I think this is actually one of the really interesting, it happens several places where he's holding back his group. They look to him for leadership. He's, buddy, he's got a bromance going with FDR and he doesn't want to upset his access to the White House. Meanwhile, the grassroots Jew is ready to do anything to protest and to call attention and to help their brothers and sisters in Europe. You know, among the, the many great ironies of history that I explore in the book is the way in which Rabbi Wise changed. He began as the young militant in the American Jewish community. He was, to begin with, he was a Zionist at a time when most of his colleagues in the reform rabbinate were anti-Zionist. And so it was, a, it was a courageous position to take. He was, um, after a little hesitation, he became the leader of the, the movement to boycott German goods in the United States, um, which some Jews were nervous about and which the Roosevelt administration strongly opposed for reasons which are discussed in the book. But the closer Wise got to power, I found, the more, the more he felt like he had some kind of access to the White House or that he, that he could have a conversation with the president, the, the closer he got, the more he retreated from his earlier um, activist instincts and his willingness to take unpopular positions. The, 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 the problem of, of balancing access and influence is, of course, one familiar to Jewish leaders um, you know, throughout time. On the one hand, um, Wise justifiably was concerned that if he was too loud or too outspoken in, in challenging the president's refugee policies, that then the doors of the White House would be closed. But the problem is he took it to the other extreme and not only held back, but in turn pressured and sometimes harassed other Jews other act activists in the community to hold back. The title, The Jews Should Keep Quiet, is a paraphrase of something that Roosevelt said to Wise. And he said it to him um, in the first of a number of um, uh, episodes that I, I describe, in which the president leans on, on Wise to lean on the Jews to keep quiet. It's a little bit like Had Gad Yah, you know, each one hits the next one. So Ro Roosevelt is pressing wise to press the, the Jews who are more activists to keep quiet, to not criticize refugee, refugee policy, to not challenge the president in any way. The by, the by now best known victims of this 
pressure from Rabbi Wise and the Jewish establishment was the group that we know as the Bergson Group, um, a leader, uh, a, a small group of, today we'd call them like a political action committee of um, young Jews, most of them, most of the leaders coming from British Mandatory Palestine. But, but they found a, a, great, um, a great body of support in the American Jewish community precisely because, as, as Thane noted, um, lower middle class immigrants, Jews were... Actors, were, artists, right? In addition to, to, to immigrants and, and, and that, and that a sector of American Jewry, there was also a whole category of, yes, prominent um, intellectuals, writers, Hollywood, uh, Hollywood figures. I mean, we see this now, right? We see this in, you know, anti-Fiat Amor protesters. It came from that community. I, I always wonder, was the Holocaust the first time in American history where famous actors, musicians, Paul Robeson? I mean, you think about the, uh, Irving Berlin. Marlon Brando. Marlon Brando was a major... Frank Sinatra. Sinatra, for sure. It goes down the line. Yeah, it's, it, you, to think about, you know, occasionally... What was it years ago? It was the concert to feed the hungry in Africa? We are the world, right? The, the, so you see this where rock stars show up. I, I actually think the Holocaust in, in New York City during the period at Madison Square Garden, the organized organizational skills and the savvy of the Bergson Group are the founders of bringing in the creative community and getting people interested in a subject they would not know. But Marlon Brando said something about it, and I should, I should listen. So this was something that really had never occurred to the mainstream Jewish leaders, that you might be able to go to a Marlon Brando um, or oh, to Edward G. Robinson. Edward G. Robinson or Stella Adler right. or, or Paul Muni or, or, or it's such a long list of entertainers who responded positively when the Bergson Group began reaching out to them. And by the way, to give the drama of this, you can imagine how much FDR despised this. You know, this is like Donald Trump when he hears that, you know, Jennifer Lopez doesn't like him. A bad, bad tweet from an actor drives Trump nuts. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt didn't tweet, but you can imagine what is Marlon Brando doing about the Jews? Why is he, what, what is this of his concern? And the reason that would worry the administration is because they knew that the public is always interested in yes. what, what, are the, what does this actor have they to say? They read People magazine. Why is Henry Fonda? It's a joke. Uh, there was no People magazine. Yeah. <laughs> Just a joke. <laughs> so, in general, what I have found is that Rabbi Wise, um, Rabbi Wise had a kind of a narrow approach to creating political alliances. He didn't really think out of the box. Hollywood was one, was one segment of American society that he never approached, but, but to go further, in his contacts on Capitol Hill, Wise restricted himself almost, almost exclusively to Democrats. It never, it, it, he, he was personally um, uncomfortable with the, with the positions on domestic, the various domestic issues that the Republicans took. And so he didn't feel, he, he, he didn't want to keep their company. So he didn't build relations on both sides of the aisle. Today we would say, APAC does say correctly, that you, you, to, the, to the extent possible, you need to have relations uh, with both major parties. But why does it look at it that way? He, did, he saw the Republicans as sort of strange and maybe hostile and representing a part of the American public that he didn't interact with personally, socially, culturally. So he never made an effort. When the Bergson Group went out and recruited former President Herbert Hoover or William Randolph Hearst, one of the most important newspaper publishers in the United States in those days, they found warm receptive allies who helped the Bergson Group rally pressure on the administration to try to do something. Now, the other, the other problem I, that, I, that, that seemed to me um, recurs in, in Wise's uh, leadership in the Jewish community was that um, his worst fears never materialized. And here's what I mean. He wasn't crazy to be worried about anti-Semitism. It was a period in American life when there was tremendous anti-Semitism. According to one count, there were over 100 anti-Semitic organizations functioning in the 1930s. And public opinion polls, to the extent that they were reliable in those days, showed a lot of prejudice against Jews. So it wasn't, it wasn't um, irrational for Wise to be afraid that Jewish protests might provoke anti-Semitism. Fine. But when Jews actually marched in Washington, 
When Jews actually did what he was afraid would cause anti-Semitism, and then it didn't cause anti-Semitism, then you have to learn from that. So if you had said to Wise in 1943, if you had said to Rabbi Wise, hey, what about bringing four or 500 Orthodox rabbis down to Washington? We'll have them march right up to the gates of the White House to plead with the president to rescue Jews. He would have said, because he did say, essentially, no, you can't do that. It'll spark a, a wave of pogroms in the United States. People will be horrified. A bunch of Jewish-looking Jews, a special pleading at the gates of the White House. But in October 1943, a few days before Yom Kippur, as we know, the Bergson Group did bring over 400 rabbis to Washington with long black coats and long white beards and black hats. And they marched to Capitol Hill, and then they marched to the White House. And then the president refused to see them, partly on the advice of Jewish leaders, apparently including Rabbi Wise, who were embarrassed by this spectacle. Now again, it wasn't crazy for Wise to be afraid that having this spectacle would cause some unpleasant ramifications. But it didn't cause those ramifications. A week later, a month later, there were no pogroms. There was a wave of anti-Semitism because rabbis had expressed their peaceful, non-violent, civil right to express their opinions in front of the White House. There was no, there was no anti-Semitic reaction. So it, that's the point at which Wise's strategy, Wise's approach becomes so troubling because he had the evidence right there before his eyes that his fears had been misplaced and yet he didn't change his relationship with the president or his approach to public protest one iota as a result. So in a way, though, this book is a work of psychology. You don't profess to be a psychologist, but in reading it, it is a work of psychology because one of the things that I did not know until I, I you know, I was, I, I, you know, worship at the school of Wyman and, and Medoff, so I just simply, I just walked around for 25 years to thinking, Fred, FDR, bad man. <laughs> Bad man, bad man, and, uh, and, 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 and roars Rabbi Wise. I don't even walk on 66th Street because of him. That, that synagogue, that street is, de is dead to me. And now I read this book and I got tripped up because one of the things I learned from this book is was not a bad guy and, in fact, had his heart in the right place and, in fact, knew what to do. And, in fact, when early on people raised questions like boycotts, he was sympathetic to this. He, in fact, trained some of the people that were involved in some of these efforts to be militant. He never was what I, you know, I remember a few years ago, uh, I spoke at the Jerusalem Post Conference, and I was shocked. What, what was the Secretary of Treasury named Lou uh, in the Obama administration? What was his first name? Jack Lou. There you go, Jack. Yeah, I was shocked. And I'm sure I didn't tell you this. I was sitting in the front row, I was about to speak next, and Jack Lou was speaking, and he got up there, I don't know if anyone was there. I'd never, I had never seen this in the United States. I'd never seen anything like this. People stood up, not one person, people stood up and screamed, court Jew, court Jew, court Jew. I, only, I always knew it was Henry Kissinger, uh, and, but, but no one ever actually pointed at him, you know, but, but in a way, I, because of you and Wyman, I just thought Wise was a court Jew, and he, he wasn't really. He, in every instance, he wanted to do the right thing. I, it, your book appears to me to be, a, 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 it's really, a, it's a romantic novel. You know, it is, it is filled with the seduction of still a rabbi, Jewish, Still a Jew not sure of his place in the United States, even a macher like Wise, never comfortable, who goes into the White House whenever he wants. He gets treated like a prince. And he, you point this out several times. He never left the White House without writing a letter to Felix Frankfurter or to Louis Brandeis. He's showing off. He has information that they need to know. You know, he's writing to all the Jewish leaders, I was with Franklin. You know, and he, first I had tea, you know, and this, this is a seduction. And it's clear that Roosevelt, you know, Roosevelt for a patrician, knew people, even unwashed people who he didn't trust. And he knew this guy can easily be seduced. 
and this guy can be manipulated. He will never betray me because I have given him the access to this office and my attention to him. Wasn't there a, a, in there a, an early anecdote where his, his daughter and son-in-law, his daughter and son-in-law were invited to have dinner at the White House. Imagine that in the 1930s. To imagine a Jew, even, even a rabbi at that level, I read it and I thought, that's extraordinary. What that, I talk, that's beyond social climbing. Today, you know, everyone wants to get a night to sleep in the Lincoln Room. Well, they had that experience in the 30s when they had dinner with the president and his wife. And so, in a way, this book is far more sympathetic. I think it's harsher on Roosevelt, in my view, and somewhat sympathetic to Wise. I, I don't know if you would agree with this. I don't think you're, you feel that you're allowed to be sympathetic to Wise. I see Rabbi Wise as a tragic figure, certainly not as a villain. I see him as a man who, who knew what needed to be done, but could not muster the wherewithal to do it. One of the most fascinating things I discovered in, in my research was an unpublished draft of Rabbi Wise's autobiography. I found this in the central Zionist archives in Jerusalem. Most of the, of the unpublished draft was essentially identical to the final published version, except for one chapter, the chapter about Roosevelt. The unpublished version, you can see, and I quote it in the book, you can see Wise struggling with the, uh, his obvious recognition that Roosevelt had indeed abandoned the Jews. And he's trying to, Wise is trying to acknowledge it, he's trying to come to grips with it, He's trying to pra praise Roosevelt, but he can't quite bring himself to praise Roosevelt because he, he had seen what had happened firsthand. But that didn't make it to the final version. He had some kind of change of heart. So this more honest um, and a kind of eye-opening version ended up on the cutting room floor. And if you look at the final published version of his autobiography, you see a chapter which is just, just lavishes uh, praise on FDR. But what, what about the, what I would call the psychological complexity of, of a man like him at his level, and you have him in here in full freak-out mode whenever he feels that another Jew might end up replacing his access to the West Wing. Full freak-out. He gets into a trash-talking mode. He will, he would, it's as if I will destroy anyone who could possibly usurp me as a Jewish leader, as a person who has the influence with the president. It happens several times where he panics and he goes into trash talking mode. I, this is a guy, this is a terrible guy. And, and, and the truth is in each one of those instances, he was bad mouthing and it was so clear. And, he, oh, and that's when he stepped in to the same language as the president. This will only inflame anti-Semitism. This will only do this. It's not even clear he believed it, but that he felt threatened that his unique access could be undermined. And that's what makes him, there's the villainy to it. There is a level of villainy to it, that his, he, his ego and his position superseded what he knew he could do to Jews and for Jews. And by the way, as you know, he was constantly straddling all the Jewish, you know, the Jewish organizations do not look good in your book. So if you're giving money to some Jewish organization, be very careful when you look at this book because they're not gonna look good. Uh, for the most part, they, and, and, they're, and oftentimes you quote letters of how people really felt, how ineffectual, how self-serving, how self-important. I, I will never think of Joseph Proskauer uh, or Sam Rosenman the same way again. You know, from reading what they, what they said, I'm sorry, I will not walk by Proskauer Rose Law Firm anymore. There's fewer and fewer city, uh, streets that I can walk on. <laughs> I, if you take this kind of a position, it's hard to get around town. But so in the case of the Bergson Group, um, Wise's hostility was so profound and extreme that, as I show in the book, he encouraged the, Ro the Roosevelt administration to try to have the group's leader, Peter Bergson, either drafted or deported in order to put him out of commission. And also, isn't, in my 
Peter Bergson is Rob Cook's son. Nephew. Nephew. I mean, so there was just, just one little brief paragraph, a sentence about that. Yes. This guy, I mean, this guy's a hero. There's just no question. This is uh, in his, the, the legacy of Israel's at the time, leading rabbi, who ends up, you know, I see more, becoming more secular and leading this group of radicals in the United States when no one else would speak. And the people that could speak were like wise who were trying to undermine them and have them deported. One of the interesting things about the Bergson group is um, that although Wise regarded them as his bitter enemy and he found them embarrassing, um, Bergson didn't go around denouncing President Roosevelt. The Berg, the, the, and these were the most activist element in the Jewish community at the time. They were very reserved. They understood that it, would, it was the middle of a world war and that the president was extremely popular. Um, and they, they never publicly directly criticized the president, but in the more than 200 full-page newspaper ads that they, that they sponsored during the 1940s, they did again and again challenge the administration's policy towards Jewish refugees. So although they didn't directly attack the president, um, the message of the ads was clear. And those, those ads were especially painful to Wise uh, and to his colleagues. And they tried, in several cases, convinced major publications to stop running the ads. Um, in particular, the, the, the political weekly magazine, The Nation, at a certain point refused to publish any more Berks and ads uh, because Wise's staff had leaned on them to cut it out. I thought it was, the, yeah, but also let's not underestimate the, those uh, gatherings, those concerts of celebrities because you see that even in this administration. Presidents are, remember President Kennedy was great with the Rat Pack crowd and everyone knew it and it made him cool. Uh, and so we've seen examples where the entertainment community rallies on your support. You know, Roosevelt, that could not have been good for Roosevelt to see America's leading artists chasing after a, 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 a Palestinian, a Jewish Palestinian who's not even here, he's not even a citizen, who's le leading a group that's embarrassing me. So the first major theatrical uh, protest in which, which Hollywood figures became involved in speaking out for Europe's Jews, was in early 1943 um, here in New York City. This was a, a pageant, as they called it, stage at Madison Square Garden, organized by the Bergson Group. And it starred a number of the, the major um, figures um, of, star, of, of, of stage and screen at the time, Edward G. Robinson, uh, Stella Adler, and others were the, were the main figures. And it was a... It was a sort of a rally, but done in theatrical form. And, and the purpose of the rally was to arouse sympathy for the Jews who by that time everyone knew were being murdered by the millions in Europe. The, um, the script for it was written by Ben Hecht, who in those days was the most prominent screenwriter in Hollywood. Uh, and the producer was Billy Rose, one of the most important uh, Hollywood producers. Rose wrote to the White House a few weeks before the event, asking if he could have a message from the president, just a message sort of greeting the audience. The pageant had, had no criticism of the administration. Again, it was just to rouse sympathy for the Jews who were being killed in Europe. Uh, and and the, the president refused to send the message. A White House aide wrote back and he said, uh, we don't want to be involved in, um, in a political affair. Political. Why is it political? Because from the, the point of view of the Roosevelt administration, anything that would arouse public interest in the plight of the Jews, anything that would mobilize sympathy, would inevitably lead to, okay, what are we gonna do about it? Maybe America can help in some way. And that's what the administration desperately wanted to avoid. It didn't want the Bergson Group, the Hollywood activists, anyone, putting pressure on them to let in more Jews. And that's, that's where, sadly, Rabbi Wise became a, a powerful weapon in the hands of, of, of a of a very clever president because when he sent wise, in effect sent wise to these other groups to pressure them, to threaten them, to warn them, to keep quiet, unfortunately sometimes it worked. With the Bergson group it didn't really work, um, but with others it did. I, I don't know if you know this, I have a really great anecdote that comes out of that Bergson event. Shortly after the war, there's a Broadway, muse, a Broadway play, a straight play, written by Ben Hecht the same Ben Hecht who wrote the play, the, the We Will Never Die. We Will Never Die. 
he was dating Stella Adler, and that's how she wound up bringing him to this Bergson event. And, uh, or no, one of the children, one of the Adler girls. Stella Adler's daughter, daughter was dating Marlon Brando. She was dating him, and that's how she got him involved. When she was with the Adlers, she was surrounded by Jews. And you know, later he had weird anti-Semitic things to say, but as a young actor, he, he loved Jews. Uh, and so he stars in this play uh, that Ben Hecht wrote. It's 1947, it's right six, at yeah, six, six, seven, six right. or seven. Yeah. I think it runs, well, yeah. it runs for two years. And in the, open, in the first scene in the second act, uh, and it, it's called The Flag is Born, and it's about the making of Israel. Uh, the, the, it's about the need to create. Right, what, right. The, it's, a po it's the first post-Holocaust play that was produced on Broadway, and it was written by Ben Hecht, A Flag is Born. And at one point, there's this incredibly dramatic moment where Marlon Brando walks up to the front of the stage, and he points at the audience, and literally, what were you doing in these years? And he literally points, I think they might have even put the spotlight on for more dramatic effect. You know, I know you spent $12 on the ticket, which was a lot of money in those days, but what did you do during this era? Um, and apparently it was very emotional, very effective, and it reinforced the work of the Bergson Group. In a way, the, the, the genesis of what the Bergson Group, to me, comes, there's a culmination of it, that because he tapped into the artistic society, that it, you ended up seeing a play by Ben Hecht on Broadway that ran for two years, and that every single night blamed people in the audience. Every night, if you came, you knew you were gonna be pointed at and blamed, as if to say, you had a moral responsibility to speak and now's your time to think about what you might have been able to do. And this is, you know, as, as Rabbi Lukstein would say, you know, this idea of teaching moral values, moral development, that, those are, that's a great teaching moment. I mean, you know, at, at a Broadway show to force you to think where you were. Why? Because he's talking about three years ago. He's talking about three or four years ago. It's right there. Everyone knows what they were doing three or four years ago. All right, let's take a few from the audience. And, uh, and then we'll say goodnight. Uh, this is a good question. It was on my list, so let's do it. Um, can you comment on the behavior of the Jewish members of Congress? Because you do several times in the book point them out. Uh, you're not impressed with them, uh, but they, they were, some of them were, they had different strategies. There weren't too many Jews in Congress in those days. So to begin with, we're talking about less than 10 members of the House at any given time, and there were no Jews in the Senate. Several of the Jewish members of Congress really stand out, and, and, and there's a book to be written by some um, enterprising PhD student. Emanuel Seller in particular. Emanuel Seller um, again and again clashed with his president. Seller was, of course, a Democrat from Brooklyn, and he was a loyal New Dealer and a, 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 a devout supporter of the president, except when it came to the president's um, failure to help the Jews. So again and again, the seller spoke out. And Wise resented him for that. And he clashed with Wise periodically because Wise felt that Seller was going too far and that Seller would be seen as the Jew attacking the president, something that Wise would, would have found very discomforting. So Seller is the standout. There were a few others who, who come up in, in, the, in, the, in the book, um, but Seller really is, the, is, is, a, is an extraordinary figure who tried his best um, despite the fact that he did not have a lot, um, a lot of clout. Sadly, the Jewish member of Congress who did have a lot of clout used it in the opposite way from which we would wish. And that was Saul Bloom, Democrat, um, also from New York. He was chairman of the House, uh, Foreign, the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He was a loyal supporter of the President's and the State Department's Jewish policy. He used his position to try to squash Jewish criticism of, the, of uh, President Roosevelt's policies. Um, he was also a member of the U.S. delegation to the infamous Bermuda Conference in 1943, which was basically a show that the administration and the British put on to give the impression that the Allies um, were concerned about the Jews when, in fact, they had no intention of taking any concrete steps to help Jewish refugees. So Bloom went there to Bermuda as a member of the delegation, along with State Department officials, and he became really kind of a public apologist 
for the president's policy, which was there's nothing that can be done to help the Jews except to win the war. That was almost a soundbite that they developed. Uh, this one, there's two short ones right here. A comment on the high percentage, if there is such a thing, of Jews in Roosevelt's administration. And then it says, do you come across, this one I love, did you come across any records of discussions between Eleanor and Franklin about Jews? There were a number of Jews um, in lower level positions in the Roosevelt administration. There were very few in more senior levels. So the notable exception is Henry Morgenthau Jr., the Secretary of the Treasury, who, for almost the entire period that we're talking about, never raised Jewish issues with the president. He felt it was in his place. When I mentioned that he asked the president to let the St. Louis passengers go to the Virgin Islands, that was the first time he had ever raised a Jewish issue. That was in 1939. And he didn't bring up another Jewish issue until later in the war, until four years later. So he, was a, he, he, was, he, he did something important, but it was very late. Yeah, but can I just say, I'm going to add my law professor piece to this. It may be the very thing that Rafi just told you might explain why, remember, during the Nuremberg tribunals, uh, Roosevelt was already dead, and, and Ro Truman was in office. And all of a sudden, the Jewish Secretary of State, who said nothing during the administration, could not be controlled on the subject of what to do about Nazi war criminals. Morgenthau was aligned with Churchill, who thought Nuremberg trials are a waste of time. Summary executions. You see a Nazi, you shoot him in the head. That's the answer. And it's shocking for the guy who said nothing. He believed in two things. He said the first thing, and Churchill was with him. You see a Nazi, just shoot him in the head. Don't, just try to do it with one bullet. Doesn't deserve two, and that's it. It's over. And the second piece was uh, the rebuilding of Europe. You know, former Secretary of Treasury say, I'm not going to spend five cents to rebuild Germany. In fact, I think... They should be subjected to 40 years of an agrarian existence. Cows, ch butter, cheese, bread. That's what you get. No, no, no Mercedes Benzes for you. Nothing. No cool electrical appliances. And just to show you that, now we know the, the, that that was defeated. Those two approaches were defeated by a number of other people, uh, Secretary of State Marshall, which is what the Marshall Plan becomes. And, and of course, people... In, thought that there should be an international trial to put the Nazis on trial. But there was this other piece, and I don't, I don't know if you must have known this, this, that Morgenthau was one of the leaders of that. Uh, anyway, go ahead. Yes, aside from Morgenthau, the other most prominent Jews in the administration were in Roosevelt's inner circle of advisors and speech writers. Um, most significantly, I suppose, would be Samuel Rosenman. He comes up a lot in the Jews should keep quiet. Rosenman was um, even worse than, um, than any of the other figures we've mentioned so far in that he repeatedly, again and again, encouraged and urged Roosevelt um, to stay away from Jewish issues and Jewish concerns. Which is not to say that he controlled the president or determined the policy. Um, president Roosevelt was a man of his own mind and, he, and, he, and it's clear from all of the evidence he would have done largely um, what he did, regardless of Jewish advisors, but it certainly didn't help. And if, if a person with a little bigger heart than Samuel Rosenman had been in that place, then perhaps he would have influenced the president to move in a, in a, in a more favorable direction at some specific Rose, juncture. Rosenman, in my mind, was the, the Exhibit A court Jew. I, I mean, think that's a fair description. There is nothing else. The uh, other question was about the first lady. Yeah, the first lady. I can only, only address this briefly, obviously, but um, there's no doubt that Eleanor Roosevelt's attitudes towards the Holocaust or the Jew Jewish victims of, the, of Nazi persecution, that her positions and attitudes were much more sympathetic than those of her, president, of her, of her husband, the president. She made a little bit of an effort from time to time. You may know that there's currently a, um, a play about her intervention on behalf of a small group of Jewish refugees who, who wanted to enter the United States. There were passengers on a ship called the Kwanzaa in 1940, and in that one case they were, in fact, admitted. But to um, Cuba. No, no, they were admitted to the United States as a result of Eleanor's intervention, but the key is small number. 
when you're talking about 70 or 80 people, is exactly the kind of situation in an election year where a little well-placed pressure from the First Lady could get that tiny handful in. But of course, the 930 Jews on the St. Louis, that was way too many. You bring them in, they're going to start dominating things. So uh, this one handful, who were kind of the exception that proved the rule, but it's to her great credit that she did make that effort. And, and, and she made a few other um, small gestures. We've talked about the theatrical production, We Will Never Die at Madison Square Garden. She attended one of the performances of that pageant when it came to Washington, D.C., and she wrote in her syndicated newspaper column about it, which gave it a lot of additional publicity, and that was important. But again, these were drops in the bucket. So, um, so naturally, it's important to be appreciative of what efforts she did make, and it's also important to keep in mind, it's not as if President Roosevelt took direction from his wife. Um, we know of many instances, for example, her efforts on behalf of African Americans, where the president simply shut her out. And when she complained to the president that Breckenridge Long, the State Department official in charge of refugee matters, was a fascist, that's the word she used, he simply, President Roosevelt simply dismissed her and refused, and told her to essentially to shut up. Um, he didn't want to hear that kind of talk about his old friend and campaign contributor, um, and, Breckenridge but Long. while we're here, since you mentioned Long, Long, who was, in, was a deputy at the time, wasn't he the deputy? He was assist, assistant assist, secretary of state. Assistant yeah. secretary of state. In many of your books and in many public lectures, you've attributed the State Department's utter contempt for Jews and the unwillingness to, that you direct, there's a direct line between Breck, Breckenridge uh, Long and that attitude. And now you're hearing that, you know, his own wife wasn't allowed to criticize him. But so I, it gives you a sense of how deep it was that his, his associates, his heart, was not in saving Jews. That but I, yeah, and I think it's important to emphasize this. Breckenridge Long and the State Department did not make refugee policy. They implemented the president's refugee policy. No State Department ever makes its own foreign policy. Um, in those days, the State Department was also in charge of immigration. It didn't make its own immigration policy. It, it was there, as it is today, to implement the policies of the president. Some historians, I, I, I find, made them, have made the mistake, in my opinion, of putting excessive blame on the State Department as if it was running its own show. But we know, first of all, that Breckenridge Long regularly briefed the president. He regularly went to the White House, told the president what they were doing in, in terms of suppressing Jewish refugee immigration. So the president knew, the president set the policy, the State Department carried out that policy. I couldn't help but notice uh, in reading it, because uh, I'm also the legal analyst for CBS News Radio, that I did a story a few weeks ago uh, in which uh, the ICE and Homeland Security interpreted a law about the public charges and that this is a basis for denying people entry into the United States if they would be a public charge. And they're using that on the southern border to prevent people coming in because the idea that if they could possibly be a public charge, then that gives the United States the, uh, the policy reason to deny them entry. I did not know that it started being used with Jews, that the public charge argument, right, that, that and you needed a much more direct relative, that the, 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 when you're saying, well, why did they turn them back? Well, they actually had a legal ar ar underbelly that provided the legal ar architecture to turn them back. Well, the, 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 I have not heard the word public charge until I heard it recently because of Donald Trump, and then I heard it again in reading your book that that was also invoked against Jews. All this is true, but the number of Jews fleeing from Germany, from Nazi Germany and also from elsewhere in Europe, who could have qualified despite the public charge requirement, who could have qualified for immigration visas, far exceeded the number that the quotas would have allowed. So despite restrictions like the public charge clause, you still had, the, you still had woefully unfilled quotas. 60, 70, 80 percent of the quotas being left unfilled even though qualified applicants um, existed and, and were, were clamoring at the gates of U.S. consulates in Germany and elsewhere. I want to read to you something that Rabbi Luchstein uh, handed me. It's a good way to end. Uh, he says, uh, in his autobiography, and that would be Stephen S. Wives' uh, autobiography, uh, 
he has left the White House when he's writing the book, and he's worried that maybe, quote, am I going to be remembered as a court Jew? Right? Well, that came up several times this morning. So you can imagine everyone's always worried about their legacy. How will I be remembered? And he says this was after he knew of the final solution, because before he's getting a sense of it. Uh, and was asked not to publicize it, right? Because that's what Roosevelt specifically said, do not publicize, until the State Department verified it. And that's just something to leave us with, because it does, again, put the pressure, the blame, the moral responsibility that you take actions without regard to what, you know, what, what, how that might be perceived later. It may seem at the time you know, beneficial and, and certainly politically appropriate. But he, I, I think one of the things is clear, he was really obtuse to this point because he saw where this was going. He was aware that there was mass murder. He was aware that he was the leading Jew in America with the best access to the White House. So a, a, a more, again, a man with less of an ego and who was less obtuse would have said, I want to get out of the White House. <laughs> I don't want to go to the White House because the more, every time I go to the White House, it will only deepen my moral responsibility because every time I went in there, I didn't get anything accomplished. And what I really want to do is leave the White House, call a press conference and say, I used to be the Jew with the greatest access to President Roosevelt, but I told the president I will not take any more invitations. I'm going to be his worst nemesis because he clearly is blind has no interest in this, and there are Jews behind me who will support me on this, uh, but I, can't, I can no longer serve in that functionary role to try to keep Jews quiet. There are obviously very important and powerful lessons that we can learn from President Roosevelt's abandonment of the Jews, from Rabbi Wise's um, relationship with President Roosevelt, and, and, and these are lessons which we can learn regardless of how we feel about the current president or his predecessor or this Jewish organization today or that Jewish organization today. With that, I'd like to say good afternoon and thank, of course, Rafi Medoff. be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.